gentlemen. We are coming back to Atlanta. Right, right now. Whoa. Mark your calendars for the second annual Black Effect Podcast Festival is happening on Saturday, April 27th. Hosted by B-Dot and Pretty V. Last year was nuts, but we about to do it bigger and better. We've got some of your favorite podcasts, like Carefully Reckless, Horrible Decisions, and The Good Brothers, Wallow 267, and Gilly the Kid, just to name a few. So get your tickets right now, blackeffect.com slash podcast festival. We'll see you Saturday, April 27th. Hi, I'm John O'Brien, host of Money and Wealth on the Black Effect Podcast Network. I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman. Now, every Thursday... My newest venture is educating you on how to win financially. Even better, I'm going to teach it in a way that, well, you can understand. I'm going to meet you where you are and take you where you need to be. We all might have different starting points and end goals, but as long as we have the desire to acquire financial freedom, it can be done. Listen to Money and Wealth with John Hope Bryant every Thursday on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Bob Pittman, Chairman and CEO of iHeartMedia. I'm excited to announce a new season of my podcast, Math & Magic, Stories from the Frontiers of Marketing. Our guests this season show us big risk can yield big rewards, like Rob Riley, the creative head of one of the world's leading advertising firms. I try to create environments where anybody can say anything without any judgment. Listen to a brand new season of Math & Magic on our very own iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Episode 396, Minimalist Pantry Formula. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, money, embrace simplicity, and live a richer life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast. My name is Jen. My name is Jill. And today we are going to walk you through creating a creating your own minimalist pantry formula. So it's not going to be the same for everyone. There are certain things everyone should keep. And what you keep in those categories will depend on you and what you use. Uh, But we're going to talk about some of that stuff and then also how to get started. So how to declutter, organize what you already have, that that whole sort of thing. So I'm very excited because I actually need to do this. And so this this one is for me. I'm excited because... I don't remember the, well, I guess we'll talk about it. The last time we talked about this specific type of thing was a very long time ago. And I think because of when we've talked about it in the past, it has helped me to form my, what are some of my staples? How am I organizing in a way that makes sense? And I feel pretty good about the pantry setup that I have. Granted, my kitchen's only about a year old, so it's not as if I've been in this space for a decade and I've got all this buildup. So that is part of the benefit for me. But I think just re-emphasizing what's good about it, how can we do it in a way that works for us is excellent. And we did send you all a poll in the friend letter. For those of you receiving it, you know that there's polls at the bottom of every email that you can kind of send your vote in. It helps us tailor the episodes to be more relevant to you. Sometimes we read off a few of your responses, which is fun. So of course, if you're not getting the friend letter, definitely do that. So you can be a part of these polls. But we asked, do you have a pantry stockpile? And y'all were all over the map on yeah. this one. So most people uh, said they are not like in love with their stockpile. They they either have too much and they should tighten it up or they don't have one and they wish they did. Um, 85 of you said, yes, it's perfect. I love my stockpile. So this one maybe is just going to be like a fun like um, confirmation you know, episode for you to be like, I'm, you know, doing what I love this. But if you're like Jesse, who (laughs) commented on this, um, this episode's truly for you. She says, the Girl Scouts keep shaking me down for money. I've got three new cookie dealers this year and I'm going to need to add cookie space to my pantry now. And Jesse, we are here for you. We will carve out a special place in the episode. Um, (laughs) 
for what to do when you have three cookie dealers and and how to organize your pantry around that. I love it so much. They're shaking me down. I got new (laughs) dealers. Amazing. Well, before we get into how to do this, this episode is brought to you by Substitutes, the restaurant wait staff's worst nightmare, the kids' maybe favorite school day, the grocery drop, uh, the the grocery drop off toss up. (laughs) Substitutes can be hit or miss, but we're going to go with a big old hit like substitutions in food that taste better than even the original recipe and boring newsletters being substituted for the front letter. It's the best kind of email full of info about freebies and the best substitute products that are better and more cost effective than name brands and so much more. Frugalfriendspodcast.com substitutes sometimes better than the real thing. Mm. May I refer to them as dupes? Ooh. Maybe. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Okay. I think you totally could. All right. Well, to get into just like a few more kind of the overall feel that you guys were giving us for this episode, um, a lot of you did like your stockpile. (laughs) The people who actually love their stockpile, just for reference, say that they have enough food to last them for a year. So I personally, that's not me. I'm more of a only buy what I need when I need it. There's just a few things that I keep a a stockpile, a minimalist stockpile of. Um, And this is really, I have been going to Sam's Club once a month for the past like five months. So this is really tested out what I need versus want for a stockpile, where is the law of diminishing returns? Where's the line between it saves me money Mm -hmm. versus I'm just adding clutter to my pantry and I'm not actually using it. I'm wasting food, wasting money. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it takes a while to really understand where that line is and your threshold of tolerance, how much space you actually have to have any version of a stockpile. I do think before we get into this first article, just really quickly highlighting why we're even advocating for a minimalist pantry setup, like the benefits of it. I think that when we can really figure out what we're going to use and we've got a really good setup and we don't have too much, we're not consuming in excess, it can encourage some more whole food cooking. When we figure out a system of how to buy, what we're making, then we can kind of know what things can we be buying in bulk, making on our own, be using the, the pantry staples that we have to make some of these condiments that maybe we would be spending so much more money on. I think it can lead to better meal planning as well. When we are able to know what's in our pantry, have easy access to it, we can form better meal plans around those things, which of course is always going to lead to less food waste when it's not just stashed full of stuff and things are going bad, they're going stale, Mm -hmm. they're expiring, we're wasting less. And then it can lead to a lot of creativity and confidence with substitutions. I think that comes with cooking at home a lot more, which I think you're going to cook at home a lot more if your pantry setup makes sense to you and is full of the things that you know you're actually going to eat. And then you can just kind of know, these are the things I keep. I'm not keeping all these random ingredients or purchasing random ingredients. And I'm going to try using what I have, even with some of these new recipes. And get creative and feel more confident about doing that. So those are just some of the benefits that I see in really, really honing in what you're keeping on hand. Yeah. When you walk into some place, and this is a really great indicator of if you need a a more minimalist pantry, if you walk into your pantry or open up your pantry and your first feeling is stress, this, you need, you need a more minimalist pantry. And minimalist doesn't mean like you have one of, you just have one can in the pantry. Whatever that looks like to you. It means you probably, if if it makes you stressed, you probably first need to, to like declutter and organize and get through some of this stuff. And that's what we're going to 
kind of talk about that process right now. Agreed. So this first article comes from this simple balance, and we're just going to go through this middle portion of the article that outlines five easy steps to an organized minimalist pantry. I thought that this was a really good rundown of what do we do? Where do we get started? And like any decluttering, organizing, minimalist effort, it's going to start with pulling everything out of the pantry. This is then also your opportunity to wipe down all of your shelves and containers and really freshen everything up. But you're not going to be able to get at what you want your pantry to look at look like unless we can gather it all, get our eyes on everything, and then see how do we want to manage it from there. And then wiping it down and is just an added bonus. Mm -hmm. So it's painful. It's going to be really messy. You're going to probably want to carve out the better portion of an afternoon for this, but you got to start there. And if it's too overwhelming, or maybe you your pantry is just a cabinet or two, just start with one shelf in the pantry, one side of the cabinet. Start with what you can and get rid of that, uh, get rid of those expired things so they're no longer causing you stress. And we go to, to number step two, group like items and declutter what you know you won't use. And in parentheses, she says, be honest. <laughs> so this is, this is, you know, real, honest transparency. Just get rid of what you know you won't use. If you are like, I think I might use this then you then give yourself the challenge to use it in the next two weeks. And if you don't use it in the next two weeks, then it leaves. It yeah. goes on your buy nothing group. Yeah. Yeah. Put it somewhere where you're going to be able to see it or even create the meal plan around that thing. Uh, but then if it's not, ex if it's nowhere near the expiration date, you just know you're not going to eat it anymore, then you can give that away to mm -hmm. a local food pantry or like you said, a buy nothing group. I like the groupings that they outlined here. If you're, if that's kind of something that's hard to get your mind around and you've got canned goods mixed with cereal, mixed with condiments. One of the things the template she uses is canned goods, including even cartons of broth would be one category. Baking supplies is another. Snacks is one different from breads and bagels, separate from condiments and spreads. Still not everything. You've still got your spices, your vinegars and oils, mm -hmm. uh, but you can kind of group it in that way. I'm sure there's stuff too on the internet of what are the different categories of food that I can be partitioning this into. Yeah. But some of that's also going to be your own intuitive processes, knowing where do you, how do you move throughout the kitchen and what do you want to have near the stove? What do you want to have near the fridge? Um, and so that's a good place to start, but then freedom to create your own system that's going to make it your kitchen most efficient for you. Which then leads us to number three, which is evaluate your kitchen setup and your pantry shelves to determine where these categories should live. They then start to use the term zones, having different zones for things. And it's exactly what we're describing here. How, how do you work in the kitchen? Where do you want things? This can even be height of things. So they describe wanting children's snacks to be accessible to the kids. So that's going on a lower shelf adult snacks are going higher. The things that she's cooking with are next to the stove. So yeah, think through who, wh where you want things to live and who needs to access them most and start setting it up in a way that makes sense for those zones. Yeah, this is actually something I have been reading about a lot recently. Like we are literally right now in the process of assembling our new kitchen yeah. cabinets. Everything is out of our pantry. This is the first time in my life I've ever had a pantry. Usually I just have a, like an upper, a, two upper cabinets. Mm -hmm. But so this is the first time in my life I have ever had a pantry. And I am figuring out what lives in the pantry, what lives near the stove, what lives near yeah. the dishwasher, and kind of going 
the things I've been reading are go with how you usually flow. Because when you are keeping everything in the pantry and it is a you're having to pull everything out when you're cooking and then put everything back in, it's it's going to be less likely that you cook. Yeah. So you want the lowest barrier to entry to cook at home. And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about in the next article. But we don't want to fight. We we good is the enemy of great, I think. Is that how great's the enemy of good? One of those. <laughs> we, we just kind of want everything to be perfect, right? Aesthetically mm. pleasing, like what we see on social media, even if maybe it's not the most, it makes the most sense for us. And so I'm right now having to go through like, okay, so maybe they say you should keep this by the oven, but I actually don't use this a lot. So maybe it makes more sense to put it in the pantry. Whereas like my protein powder that I'm, you know, using every day, having that more like out. So Mm -hmm. that's just something you're going to have to figure out for yourself. And they were saying use sticky notes Mm. um, to put on different shelves of the pantry and different cabinets when you're kind of going through and organizing so that you can, A, like maybe remember a new setup and the people in your family can can remember a new setup. setup. So in the future when they're putting away dishes and groceries, (laughs) they kind of will know. But, But to kind of get a feeling for... Um, m- when you move something around, like yeah, yeah, how it feels, yeah, what needs to have visibility. But I also think we need to take into consideration how certain things need to be stored. So some things do better in the dark versus out in possible sunlight. You know, like p- possibly your oils and like even just vanilla. I know that's very specific, but like you're not going to want that out on the counter where the sun's constantly hitting it. So that needs to be going somewhere within a shelf. So that's another thing to be processing too as you're organizing. Like what does the best proper food storage for longevity look like? And then of course, number four is a little bit talking to maintenance, but making sure that you're putting things back in their zones, keeping like items together, which goes hand in hand with what you just mentioned, Jen, about possibly putting up notes where things go as you're learning a new system so that it doesn't become just chaotic all over again. And you've got canned goods in every possible shelf of your kitchen and Mm -hmm. pastas everywhere, but maintaining it, putting it back. Yeah. And here's another great thing about a minimalist pantry and another you know reason it's a great idea is that when you're putting groceries away, we put them away in the back, not in the front. Yeah. First in, first out. Uh-huh. So we we run it like we are pushing as best to our ability, pushing the cans up to the front. Mm-hmm. And then we're putting the new cans in the, in back. the back. Yes. So yes, that's like a little grocery store. Yeah. And when you're when you're overwhelmed and you have a too many things, you can't really push things to the front or slip them into the back. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to help reduce waste. Uh, It's going to help make sure that we're using everything. Uh, We're going to avoid buying things that we're not sure if we're going to use because they're going to be in the front. And I would say also little stickers that you can put dates on. Like if there's been something that you haven't used in a while, put a sticker with a date on it. Yeah. And say like, I have to use this by this date or it leaves. Yeah. Well, I think that was even a zone she talked about in this article that she'll even have a zone for what they're going to meal plan that upcoming week, things that might be nearing expiration date. This is the I need to use it this week Mm -hmm. kind of zone, cook with it, implement it. and, And it may not even be in its like typical zone. She's got a use up zone Mm -hmm. too. So there's another idea. Yeah. Which leads to the last one, which I love, love, love. Only buy organizational containers or baskets if they will truly make your life easier. 
nobody is going to see your pantry. Mm -hmm. You're typically 99% of us are not opening up our pantries to show people on social media. Even in this article, I love that the pictures of her pantry are not super like container store esque. Uh Like they're just things in shelves. She doesn't even have a typical pantry, like a walk in pantry. It's just like an open up pantry. It's beautiful because it's when I look at her pantry, I am not stressed. Yeah. It's not, there's no like plastic container beauty labels or anything. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it, it doesn't stress me out because you can see everything. One of my favorite things to do in being able to organize and corral things together, but not feel like I have to spend money is just using some of the cardboard boxes, either from non-food items or the food items themselves. Like if I happen to get a thing of granola bars, I just clip the top off and keep it in its container. If there's like a nice cardboard box that came with something that then I can like dump other little snacks into Like there are ways to have organization, but it doesn't have to mean that we're spending a ton of money on plastic stuff. That said, I do think that there could be room for certain items going into better sealed containers, Mm -hmm. like your cereals and maybe your snacks that kids are getting into often that are not individually packaged. I say that for kids, but my experience is some of our guests have been getting it and we don't keep a ton of snacks like Cheez-Its is one and chips are another that like we keep on hand and then we don't eat it very often, but we're, we're very judicious about putting, you know, a clip on the bag. Well, we've been noticing that when we have a lot of guests in town, they'll get into the snacks and they may not close up the bag. They don't know the chip clip. And it goes stale. So I will say we did just buy a couple of containers for some of those like very perishable snacks that Mm -hmm. are not individually packaged, primarily for our guests. And if you have children that are like my guests who aren't going to seal things up, then maybe containers that you don't have to get brand new, you can find them at the thrift store, you can find them Uh, And yeah, they don't have to be like all the aesthetically pleasing, whatever, just something that's going to seal it up better and help your food to last longer. That would be my one vote for getting containers. Jenna, she's not talking about you. No, I'm not talking about you, Jenna. You guys are I can't think of any other your guests that listen to the show. (laughs) (laughs) Now everyone's going to wonder, did I not close that? And truly, I don't know who it was because it's been forever since we went to try to eat Not forever, because now you're going to think, oh, that's your problem. No, they just truly (laughs) weren't put away. But anyways. But yeah, so you just get the organizational containers that will support your lifestyle. And you really can't tell what those organizational containers are until after you have decluttered Uh the pantry, you have created a rhythm for yourself yeah. and you've lived it for several months. Yes. You've kind of you've decided what length of, you know, quote unquote stockpile am I happy with? Is it one year or one month or somewhere in between? Everyone's going to have a different level of comfort. Yes. And and what does my space provide for? A lot of people in the poll were like, I'd love to have a stockpile, but I live in a tiny tiny kitchen. Uh-huh. So what does your space provide for? as well, because some of these organizational containers take up more space than they really need to. So get into the rhythm, Mm -hmm. figure out what works for you, and then buy the containers. Yeah. Don't get all the exercise equipment until you're in Mm -hmm. an exercise routine. Don't get all the containers until you've decluttered and organized your pantry, and now you know what you need. Yes. For many of us, there comes a time when we need to navigate some complex money situations, and it's tough to know who to trust when receiving crucial financial advice. That's where Fearless Finance comes in. Fearless Finance is making financial advice more affordable and accessible. They're a fee-only financial planning firm that provides on-demand comprehensive financial planning by the hour without the high fees and long-term commitments that come with traditional financial advisors. You can quit whenever you want with no strings attached. 
Their planners meet you where you are at on your financial journey. So whether you're looking to buy a house, optimize your savings, or just want to get expert eyes on your finances to ensure you're on the right track, they can answer your questions and help you achieve your goals. Visit fearlessfinance.com today to get started. You can chat with a planner for free to make sure it's a good fit. And you'll get $50 off your first planning meeting when you use the code FRUGAL. Hi, I'm John O'Brien, host of Money and Wealth on the Black Effect Podcast Network. I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman. Some would call a thought leader. Now, every Thursday, my newest venture is educating you on how to win financially. Even better, I'm going to teach it in a way that, well, you can understand. No unexplained theories, no mundane lessons, no using 20 words when two will do. I'm going to meet you where you are and take you where you need to be. I'm giving you straight talk, relatable stories, and life lessons through my own experiences and the lens of others. We're not just talking about why financial freedom is important. We're focusing on how you can achieve it too. We all might have different starting points and end goals, but as long as we have the desire to acquire financial freedom, it can be done from the streets to the suites. Listen to Money and Wealth with John Hope Bryant every Thursday on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Bob Pittman, Chairman and CEO of iHeartMedia. I'm excited to announce a new season of my podcast, Math & Magic, Stories from the Frontiers of Marketing. Our guests this season remind us to embrace change and fearlessly look toward the future. Like Andrew Jarecki, award-winning filmmaker and creator of Movie Phone. The studios didn't really control the theaters. The theaters didn't control the studios. And I thought, well, there's a window in here where I could make things easier for the consumer and also make something that would be very useful for the industry. Or Kellen Kenny, Chief Marketing and Growth Officer at at and who installed fiber in customers' houses rather than leading from afar. It is so crucial that you spend time with the customers. That is the best lesson. In these exciting times, we're looking to the math, the strategy and analytics, and the magic, the creative spark more than ever. Listen to a brand new season of Math & Magic on our very own iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Okay, so this next article comes from Frugal Minimalist Kitchen. There's literally wow, exactly no what we're better talking about. <laughs> website to find what we are talking about. This is the website. And with this one, we just want to go through what are some of the pantry staples. Now, here's the thing. We're going to go through this list and give our own little take on it. Mind you, this is not a shopping list. Nope. <laughs> this is not a list for you to go say, ah, oh, I have to keep a lot of dry goods on hand. No, you don't. Unless you cook with dry goods, it's more of an idea of what are some of the staples within dried goods? What's a good idea of how many of each of these staples I need to be having on hand? At the end of the day, you're going to need to answer that question for yourself after you've kept a pulse on how you cook, what you eat, how how often you're at home doing these things. Mm -hmm. um, but just to get a sense for what are some of the things that people generally might keep yeah. on hand. And the, and the way I would interpret this list is, I would say, so like the first, you know, on dry goods, the first thing here is nuts and seeds. And it's saying seeds, one to three of chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. The way I would interpret this is if I'm looking at my pantry and I have five different boxes or bags of seeds, then I might say, okay, I probably only need three because mm -hmm. unless I'm eating seeds every day, Five, unless I'm eating yeah. seeds five days a week, I probably don't need five different seeds, yeah. right? So think about how many times you're consuming seeds mm -hmm. each week. I'm really glad seeds is the first one on here. <laughs> yes. Think about how many times you're consuming them each week and then maybe have that many, okay? Yeah. Or if you're hearing this list and we're like chia seeds and you're like, oh my gosh, I eat those all the time. It's in everything. Yeah. And I'm just always buying them when I run out. Maybe then next time they are on sale, then that's you buy the a stock up. Okay. Yeah. So that's how I would, when I hear this list, that's how I would process it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, so then the next category would be canned items, beans and lentils. So this is where we're talking about canned tomatoes, tomato sauce, canned fruit, coconut milk, even canned fish or meat like canned chicken. And then your beans and lentils, kidney beans, chickpeas, black beans, brown lentils, dried chickpeas, dried red lentils, dried split peas. That's going to have so much to do with how you cook. Are you more a person who's going to get the dried stuff and you're going to soak it in water and then cook it? Like, are you ready for the long process? Are you the person who is using the can for your beans and lentils. And that's the way that you need to be supplying and stockpiling. Also, how often are you using canned tomatoes, canned tomato sauce? Are you making a lot of soups and stews and maybe pastas? Then yeah, that's for you. If not, you know the canned items that you purchase and start to keep inventory of how often am I using these things? What what would be better to kind of keep in my supply and what don't I really need? For me personally, I don't ever do canned fruit. Nothing against it. It's just not in my MO. I don't use canned fruit. I don't eat canned fruit. I don't buy canned fruit, even if it's on sale. But I am I'm a person who likes me some some canned chicken for a buffalo chicken dip. Mm-hmm. So I keep that on hand. Yes. It's one of those things. Think about the recipes when you're going to a potluck or um, your struggle meal recipes that you just feel like really safe making, make sure you have those things on hand at all times. So like she's talking, one of her big things is like, how do you know how much pasta to have on hand? <laughs> or like how many? Because there's so many different types of mm-hmm. pasta. So uh, she's saying for grains, like oh, have an oat. If you do overnight oats, baked oats, whatever, Uh, oats are one of the things that I will like stock up on at Sam's Club because we do an oat, some kind of oat thing every week. Um, White rice, brown rice, I would say probably you could pick one, Mm -hmm. whatever you love most. And then um, other grains. So she says about two of different other grains, but that's optional. If you're not adventurous with your grains, don't worry about it. And then she says one long pasta and one short pasta. Again, if maybe you're just a, I I would say short pastas are great for kids, like the shells. Um, So we definitely have shells and spaghetti Uh all the time. Um, And then lasagna. If you make lasagnas, keep your lasagna noodles on hand. Otherwise, that's not a struggle meal. Like, I don't think you really need to keep lasagna nudes on yeah. hand at all times. I'm not making my own lasagna. It's yeah. It's not for me. Yeah. Um, but then and further, like, choose your dried, choose your canned, um, and then, yeah, see how it goes. Yeah, I think two to three types of breakfast cereals, and that's going to depend on your family size, but be aware of how many boxes of cereal. I think that's one of the number one things just from my own perception that gets wasted in families. You make it halfway through the box and maybe it's starting to get stale at that point because you had so many other options. So now you've got five boxes, all of which aren't empty. And what are you going to do with it? Because none of them taste good anymore. We'd be better off to go one to two, plow our way through those and then get the different variety Mm -hmm. that we want. Um, Then yeah, your peanut butter, your cornmeal, cornstarch, which then bleeds into baking supplies. And this is going to depend on how often you bake. I don't bake. Yeah. So how much flour, sugar, powdered sugar, baking sodas, baking powders, vanilla extract do you need to be keeping on hand? And, and not going overboard because these things, while they are relatively shelf stable, they do expire. Mm-hmm. And especially when it comes to flour and sugar bags, I don't know why this is the way that they've chosen to package these items because there's always little bits of flour and sugar coming out of it, which tells me it's not that well sealed. So If you live in an area, which I think is everywhere, that ants or other pests could be a problem, that's not a great thing to be stockpiling in your pantry. For me, the way that I approach it is I've just got a big jar 
that I keep my flour in. And when it's about halfway down is when I will purchase more. But if I do feel like, oh, I, okay, it's on sale. I want to have more bags. I feel like I've I've got to seal it better than how it is currently sealed, which is a bummer. So yeah, I'm like putting it in a bag of some sort or maybe wrapping it in plastic wrap because I don't want animals to get to it and ruin the fact that I got it on sale. Yeah. And I, it says that once opened, all-purpose flour lasts uh, six to eight months. And you can store it in a in the refrigerator, last it up to a year. Um, white flowers like cake flour, similarly good for a year. Uh, self-rising flour uh, is an exception because it contains baking powder. And I don't know what the exception is there. But uh, so... I typically will, like when we did our grocery sales cycles episode, um, I will buy my baking supplies around November because it's all on sale. And I will, that's when I will like get rid of last year's stuff, anything left over. But that's really it. Yeah. I don't do, I mean, I need these stuffs. I, do have to have sugar and flour, baking yeah. soda, baking powder for stuff I do. Yeah, but not a ton. Right. So that's definitely yeah, not agreed. something I stock up on. And I've started <clears throat> making my own vanilla. If anyone out there is a baker, you probably already know about this, but vanilla is so expensive. It's somewhere around 20 bucks for a little bottle these days. Um, and vanilla beans are also expensive, but it can be as simple. I mean, look up a recipe, but it can be as simple as two vanilla beans in a dark container. Cause that is one of those things that you need to store in a specific way. Like it's recommended that it be in a darker glass container with vodka. And then you let it sit for a few months and there you go. You got vanilla and then you can just keep topping it off. You keep the bean in it and you just keep topping it off with vanilla and let it sit. And there you go. Vanilla extract. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So then my final one to chat about on here is the herbs and spices category. This one was a hard call out (laughs) to me. What did they recommend? They're like, we recommend that you only keep about, I want to say it was like 15 spices, maybe 15 to 20 spices. That sounds about right. Um, and, and maybe I'm right around there, but they're kind of describing how most people aren't going to be using more than salt, pepper, oregano, basil, thyme, chili flakes, cayenne, chili powder, paprika, cumin, but you're going to know what you use more regularly. Like for some, you do like your curry powder, garam masala, your turmeric, um, and, and maybe for others, you're just keeping it a little bit more simple, but we don't need to feel pressured to buy the the random spice mixes. Like mm-hmm. there's so many recipes I use that call for Italian seasoning that I almost got trapped into. Oh, I don't have Italian seasoning. Going to have to put that on the list. And then you look up what's an Italian seasoning and it's oregano, thyme, basil. It's all the things I already have on hand. So you just make your own little mix. You don't need a fajita seasoning. You don't need a... If you've got these 15 to 20 spices already on hand and just a quick Google search of what's a substitute, speaking of substitutions, speaking of dupes, there's so much we can make ourselves and also replace fresh herbs with some of these dried herbs. Yeah, it might compromise some of the flavor a little bit, but not, I mean, I love me some fresh herbs, but if you don't have them on hand, you don't got to run out to the store. Mm -hmm. I kill fresh herbs before I ever get to (laughs) use them. So I'm a dry girl all the way. But yeah, I will not buy a spice or herb until I have used another one. So that's, I have a finite space available for herbs and spices and that's the space. Yeah. And if they don't fit there, then I'm not going to put them somewhere else. Yes. So that's kind of my rule and they should all be as close to the oven as possible, or they don't get used. Yeah. Because if they're in the pantry or a cabinet that's far away, I'm too lazy to go over and get them. They have to be, uh, for a while, They I had a spice rack like uh, screwed into the wall. Uh-huh. So they were just right there. And now with our new cabinets, I made sure to do a pull-out spice rack cabinet. Yes, I love my pull-out spice rack cabinet. Yes. Yeah, and then... 
just whittle it down. That, I mean, basically, if there's any takeaway from this section of the article, it's in each of these categories, figure out what you use regularly, what you don't use, use up everything you have or give it away for free, but then allow that to inform what you're purchasing going forward. Don't be afraid of substitutions. She talks about that a lot with the oils and the vinegars, that there's so many different substitutions that you can use if you don't have a very specific type Mm -hmm. of vinegar. Well, what vinegar do you have on hand? And take to the internet and see, could that be a substitute in the recipe that you're using? What, What else can be utilized? You can mix and match some of these things. I mean, don't tell that to the chefs and the writers of these recipes, but for so many, you don't have to follow it exactly to a T. Yeah. And then I think what this can lead to for us is considering what can we cut out? Are there things that we've been purchasing that now that we've got a better handle on what we're keeping on hand, our cooking has improved, we're using what we've got. Are there certain things that now we're ready to just be making ourselves or we don't need? This person who wrote this article described how they're not, they really aren't buying chips, soda, candy anymore as as a result of some yeah. of this minimalist pantry they just realized they, they're not using it that much so they could cut it out for me i love chips like it's it's my guilty pleasure chips will always be a part of my pantry maybe there'll come a day where it's homemade chips i'm open to that wow. but chips are not getting cut out but yeah similarly for me soda candy canned fruit there's just certain things that i know i don't need so i'm not going to buy it i'll figure out another way Um, or I'll figure out how to make it myself, which has been really fun. Like making your own mayonnaise, making your own salad dressing, making your own bread. Yeah. I'm not willing to go do any of that, but I think (laughs) if I could give you one takeaway from this episode to just get you over the hump is it doesn't have to be a full take everything out and reorganize and minimal minimize just take out like reach in the back of your cupboards or pantry and pull out like 10 items Mm -hmm. just 10 maybe or three to five per week depending on how big your stockpile is if it's smaller three if you're one of those people that's got like a year worth pull out five and try for april to use three to five of those older items each week. Mm -hmm. And let's cut about um, 12 to 20 items out of the stockpile. If you're feeling, if again, you're opening up your cupboards or pantry and you're like, I should probably cut a little of this out. Uh Uh, Then let's make a goal. 12 to 20 items get used up. uh, And if they don't get, if those you know, items don't get used up in April, then they get given away in the buy nothing group. Yeah. I also like, as far as maintenance goes, doing a monthly or quarterly or maybe even just biannually pantry challenge to keep down the buildup. Mm-hmm. If you are prone, if you've got a big family, you're prone to collecting a lot of things, then challenge yourself to do one of those pantry challenges where you're only cooking from your pantry for how a set amount of time you decide a week, two weeks, a full month, depending on how much you have on hand. And that can be a way to maintain all the hard work that you just put in. Yeah. And then decide what your pantry staples are, maybe like five to 10 of them and create an acronym around the first letter of each word. And then let us know what it is. Ooh, and have a list of maybe five recipes that you can make with those pantry staples. Yes. Just for those days when you your brain can't think anymore. Not that you could, but that you already do and you that already feel safe. So let those recipes kind of guide your pantry formula and then turn it into a fun acronym. Do you know what? It, we have a fun acronym for it and is our guiding light for this podcast that is a staple. Yes. And I'm trying to think of a, what it is an acronym for off the top of my head. Well, just it's B-O-T-W for the Bill of the Week. It's time for the best 
best minute of your entire week. Maybe a baby was born and his name is William. Maybe you paid off your mortgage. Maybe your car died and you're happy to not have to pay that bill anymore. Duck bills, Buffalo bills, Bill Clinton. This is the Bill of the Week. Hey, Jed and Jill, this is Caitlin. I'm a longtime listener, and I was actually featured on your debt-free YouTube series in early 2023. I shared a little bit about my journey with student loan debt and then getting my master's degree where I actually profited money. I had just started on my doctorate at the time of that recording, and now I am back to share my bill. My final tuition bill for my program was paid and then reimbursed by my employer. So between comparing and price shopping degree programs for value and institutional grant and tuition reimbursement from my employer, I am super happy and proud to share that my total out-of-pocket expense for my doctorate in education was zero dollars. That's right. I got an advanced degree for free. I just finished writing my dissertation and I'm preparing for the final defense. I hope by the time this airs, I will officially be Dr. Caitlin. And since my program is pay per term, I have time left in my term to finish a postdoctoral certificate in organizational leadership. So I will definitely be taking advantage of this extra freebie. This is just a reminder that a quality education does not have to be expensive. And there is a difference between paying for an educational experience and paying for an academic program. Thanks for all you do. Caitlin. Dr. Dr. Caitlin. Oh, girl. Spilling some wisdom. Oh, so good to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, a, a, your story was impressive. Like when we interviewed you for Debt Free Stories, we have all 10 of those stories on our YouTube channel if you want to check them out. But gosh, getting a doctorate for free. free. And just knowing like y- there was nothing special that you did. You did. It's not like you had connections that got you these grants like from your parents or whatever like yeah. y- Caitlin you Researched did this and, uh-huh. you did this you deserve that doctor <laughs> and I hope it's encouraging to other people who are th- especially in education where things can get really disheartening yeah. um gosh that that Caitlin was able to do it and so I love that. I'm going to butcher it now, but I'm going to want that on another bumper sticker. There's a difference between paying for an educational experience versus an academic Academic program. program. Yeah. So true, man. I mean, that's what we're seeing with online programs. Mm -hmm. Online programs can be much less expensive. Some people don't like it because they're not getting an experience, but they are getting an academic program. Yeah. Oh man, Dr. Caitlin, well done. We're celebrating with you. If you all are listening and you happen to have gotten your doctorate for free somehow, some way, or your name is Bill and maybe you're a professor of one of these academic programs. Dr. Bill. If you're a Dr. Bill, Oh, that'd be so fun. Visit Come on in. Frugalfriendspodcast.com slash bill to leave us your bill. We're ready to listen to it. For many of us, there comes a time when we need to navigate some complex money situations, and it's tough to know who to trust when receiving crucial financial advice. That's where Fearless Finance comes in. Fearless Finance is making financial advice more affordable and accessible. They're a fee-only financial planning firm that provides on-demand comprehensive financial planning by the hour without the high fees and long-term commitments that come with traditional financial advisors. You can quit whenever you want with no strings attached. Their planners meet you where you are at on your financial journey. So whether you're looking to buy a house, optimize your savings, or just want to get expert eyes on your finances to ensure you're on the right track, they can answer your questions and help you achieve your goals. Visit fearlessfinance.com today to get started. You can chat with a planner for free to make sure it's a good fit. And you'll get $50 off your first planning meeting when you use the code FRUGAL. Hi, I'm John O'Brien, host of Money and Wealth, on the Black Effect Podcast Network. I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman, some would call a thought leader. Now, every Thursday, my newest venture is educating you on how to win financially. Even better, I'm going to teach it in a way that, well, you can understand. No unexplained theories, no mundane lessons, no using 20 words when two will do. I'm going to meet you where you are and take you where you need to be. I'm giving you straight talk relatable stories and life lessons through my own experiences 
and the lens of others. We're not just talking about why financial freedom is important. We're focusing on how you can achieve it too. We all might have different starting points and end goals, but as long as we have the desire to acquire financial freedom, it can be done from the streets to the suites. Listen to Money and Wealth with John Hope Bryant every Thursday on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Bob Pittman, Chairman and CEO of iHeartMedia. I'm excited to announce a new season of my podcast, Math & Magic, Stories from the Frontiers of Marketing. Our guests this season remind us to embrace change and fearlessly look toward the future. Like Andrew Jarecki, award-winning filmmaker and creator of Movie Phone. The studios didn't really control the theaters. The theaters didn't control the studios. And I thought, well, there's a window in here where I could make things easier for the consumer and also make something that would be very useful for the industry. Or Kellen Kenny, chief marketing and growth officer at AT AT&T, who installed fiber in customers' houses rather than leading from afar. It is so crucial that you spend time with the customers, that is the best lesson. In these exciting times, we're looking to the math, the strategy and analytics, and the magic, the creative spark more than ever. Listen to a brand new season of Math & Magic on our very own iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now it's time for The Lightning Round! Okay, what are your top Three pantry staples, the things that you always have on hand. Everything else can go except these three. That is the subline. Uh-huh. Do you have an answer? Um, so mine is definitely um spaghetti noodles. With that would be marinara. Um and then <sighs> I, I know this is weird, but I think it's um, like coconut milk. Yeah. I almost wrote that. Too. Yeah. Because um, I use it for so many different things, like my chicken and rice bakes, my curries, uh, just it adds a creaminess. Uh-huh. It's a good substitute just when making rice like instead yeah. of water or broth using coconut milk. Mm. Add some mango in it. Mm. Mango coconut rice. Ooh. Is so good. You make it? Yes. <gasps> and then add some curry with it. Wow. It good. Um, this does check out because <laughs> there have been, I want to say, I'll go with one to be conservative, but it might have been twice now that at some sort of Christmas holiday gift exchange, you have brought noodles and marinara sauce as the gift. (laughs) Once. I did that one time, Jill. Okay, then maybe you did it a second time as a meal delivery like when we've signed up amongst our friend group yes. like somebody needs a meal you just drop off a box of noodles and no, I did. oh my gosh no i'm pretty sure i'm not an uncooked you box think of no noodles. you think no <laughs> no i'd at least make it and i'd use a penne <laughs> That's better. Yeah. <laughs> penne, penne's the elevated. Penne yes. is to Carabas what spaghetti is to Olive Garden. Is that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, but it's just wholesome. If you've just had a baby or you're sick, like just had surgery, like what do you want? You want a hot bowl of carby goodness. Yeah. Oh, it's just so comforting. Yeah. And I want to make people feel good. <laughs> With your nudes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jill, your turn. Oh, man, I really struggled with this one. Here we go. This is what I wrote down. I, I did write down four, but rice, beans, salt. And if I get to add in flour. I don't think salt counts. I think you can replace salt with flour. Okay. Now, as much as I, I really, truly don't bake but I am in my sourdough era. So I'm making a lot of bread. And to me, this feels like if I had these things, I can subsist. And 
even enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, <laughs> rice and beans, I guess it is it is the staple, but you can make rice and beans taste so yummy. Also, I'm assuming we're talking pantry staples, and then you get your fresh produce. So if you can add produce into a rice and bean combo, just rice, just beans, bread. Yum. You can self-sustain. Carby goodness. <laughs> I think what the takeaway is, is... We like carbs. 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 <laughs> Bread. Pasta. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this helped you in... If you feel like your pantry or your cabinets are a little overwhelming, uh, giving you a step one to kind of making it a little bit more minimalist and how to maintain that. And then if you feel like your kitchen is too small, you can't have a stockpile, maybe you do have space for a minimalist stockpile. And maybe this has helped you kind of see what you need to take out and focus on keeping. And so if this helped you, we would love if you would leave us a review uh, on on Apple and Spotify. It really helps us. It makes us A, feel good, uh, but B, it's a way you can support the show for free uh, and, and help people find it and get the same help that you have received. Kind of like Chelsea, who has given us two thumbs up And she says, great podcast. I love the humor and realness of Jen and Jill as they share tips that are actually useful and easy to start implementing. Thanks, J&J, for changing the world one wallet at a time. May we all spend less and vacation more. (laughs) What a good takeaway. Yeah. Not just spending less for the sake of spending less. But so we can vacation more. So we can vacation more. Thanks, everyone, for listening. If you've got a fun review like Chelsea's that you want to share with us, please do it. Wherever you're listening, give us a rating and review. It does help other new people find us. It just helps us. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Frugal Friends is produced by Eric Siriani. Okay, Jill, this is how I know the bread people have gone too far. I am now seeing social media posts for celebration loaves. Have Uh, you seen them? Oh, no. It's sourdough with sprinkles in it. So, like, they want to take over cake? Yeah. They don't want cake to exist anymore? Yeah. And I was like, that looks disgusting. It's not like... (gasps) a cinnamon loaf. It's not like a sweet loaf. It is a loaf of bread, bread. with sprinkles. And Are it's a sure? celebration loaf. Well, you yeah, sure that's all it is because you could make a loaf a little bit more sweet. Yeah, no, no. Savory. I know. It's definitely not a savory loaf, but it's just a regular sourdough. At least the ones I've been seeing. Uh-huh. Maybe some people are still living in the real world and they create a sweet, you know, a dessert loaf. Right. And put sprinkles in it. But no, this these ones that bad. I'm seeing. And then one girl was like, dye free celebration loaf. And none of the dye free sprinkles are heat stable. So she takes celebration loaf out of the oven and the only color left is yellow. I was like, this is everybody's gone too far. They've gone too They've far. They've gone too far. They, they have. The world has gone insane. <sighs> mm-hmm. So, all that to say. You know, but that's that's what happens to people is we get our hands on something good and then we just... Ruin it. Take it to the bottom of the ocean and ruin it. Yeah. We just have to take it so, so far. So just know when you start adding sprinkles to your sourdough... I'm cutting off your supply of flour. Heard. Thank you. (laughs) Diamonds Direct Spring Sale starts this weekend. Get 20% off rings, earrings, pendants, bracelets, and more. It's the best store-wide sale of the season. Plus, book an appointment and get an additional $100 off. That's 20% off plus $100 off store-wide. And enjoy an expanded selection of the latest styles with designer appearances each weekend. Tons of engagement rings on sale, too. 20% off starts Friday and open Sundays. Details at DiamondsDirect.com. Ladies and gentlemen. 
We are coming back to Atlanta. Right, right now. Whoa. Mark your calendars for the second annual Black Effect Podcast Festival is happening on Saturday, April 27th. Hosted by B Dot and Pretty V. Last year was nuts, but we about to do it bigger and better. We've got some of your favorite podcasts, like Carefully Reckless, Horrible Decision, and the Good Brothers Wallow 267 and Gilly the Kid, just to name a few. So go get your tickets right now. BlackEffect.com slash podcast festival. We'll see you Saturday, April 27th. Hi, I'm John O'Brien, host of Money and Wealth on the Black Effect Podcast Network. I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman. Now, every Thursday, my newest venture is educating you on how to win financially. Even better, I'm going to teach it in a way that, well, you can understand. I'm going to meet you where you are and take you where you need to be. We all might have different starting points and end goals, but as long as we have the desire to acquire financial freedom, it can be done. Listen to Money and Wealth with John Hope Bryant every Thursday on the Black Effect Podcast Network, iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.